Would you stand with me, please, as we read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. So Jesus is repeating, sort of, some of what we read in Isaiah. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. So the favorite season of the year for some folks is coming up, election season. <laughs> and the end of October, the beginning of November, there are going to be some commercials on, and they're going to be a little harsh, aren't they? They are going to attack somebody saying, this is the worst person in the world. No, this is the worst person in the world. And the words are going to get sharp because it's coming to a climax. It's coming to a decision point. And that's the moment we're in, in Mark chapter 12 here. Jesus has been in, walking around the country for three years. He's been healing people, doing good, teaching wonderful things. And Mark chapter 12 is in Holy Week. So Mark 11 was Palm Sunday. We're actually out of sequence a little bit that way. So this is probably Monday or Tuesday after Palm Sunday. Maybe Monday. And on Thursday, he's going to be arrested. And on Friday, he's going to be hanging on a cross. This is at the very end, and the pressure is getting really intense because Jesus is pushing on the religious leaders, and they see him as an incredible threat. And the words get a little pointed, and they're trying to debate their way Debates are not new. They're trying to debate Jesus into oblivion. So if you go back just a few verses, you get the, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders coming to Jesus, and they try to trap him. They say, by what authority are you doing these things? They asked. We'll get to that notion a little later. Brother, can you spare a trillion? But they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who says you could do this? And they think they've got Jesus trapped, and Jesus says, well, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Answer me, and I will tell you. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? And now they're trapped, because if they say it's from heaven, if they say John's baptism is from heaven, well, John was pointing to Jesus. John said Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So then they can't say that or they have to follow Jesus. But the entire country loved John the Baptist, so they can't go against John the Baptist either. So they just walk away. They, they are trapped in this debate. And 
you go a few verses later, and it says later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So that they are really in a verbal argument right now. There's nothing showing on the surface. But in a couple days, all of that is going to change. And Jesus tells them a story that they do not want to hear. Jesus tells them a parable. And parables in general are these wonderful stories that don't pertain to anything in particular. They, they tell a, a great truth, they point to a great moral, but the different elements of the story don't actually always equal this person or that thing. But this story is different. This story, Jesus is telling them, and they understand who he's talking about as he's telling them. So this is a story that the leaders don't want to hear because they know that he's pointing against them. So we're jumping to the end of the story at the beginning just to give you a clue. This is not just an innocent story. This is an accusation from Jesus against the religious leaders. So he starts out and he says, Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. And they all say, oh, we know this story. God's the one who plants a vineyard. We read about this in Isaiah. God plants the vineyard and our people have not always been faithful, so sometimes God is angry with the vineyard and he's going to judge. We, we like this story. This is, this is something we'll, we are familiar with. We just read about that in Isaiah 5 this morning. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. So they know we're the vineyard and God is the owner and Jesus goes on with his story and turns out there's some problem tenants. He says at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. He sent still another, and that one they... And he sent many others. <sighs> These tenants are bad. Now, what I didn't realize for years, when I think of planting and harvesting, I think of Iowa. So we plant in the spring, and when do we harvest? In the fall. That's not the way it works with vineyards. This, it, with a vineyard, you plant the vineyard, and you reap in a few years, four or five years, you can come back. So it says that he planted the vineyard, the owner did, and then he moved away and he left it in the stewardship of these tenants who are supposed to take care of it. So it's been years and they've forgotten about the owner and they feel like this is ours. We're in control. We own this thing. This belongs to us. We're the ones who have been showing up and taking care of this thing. He, the owner never did. What right does he have to this? That's how a lot of people treat their lives in regard to God. I'm in charge. I'm the one who's had to go through the scraped knees and the verbal attacks I've gotten and had to endure all the stuff that people have dragged me through. Where was God? And we forget that God was right there. Carrying us through. And the owner calls for some of the harvest. And we don't know which kind of grapes it was for sure. So we, we should probably take a poll here this morning. So who thinks green grapes are the best grapes? Okay, we got it. Not very many. Who thinks red grapes are the best grapes? Oh, my. High V, we, in Fairway, they should be. Who thinks purple grapes are the best grapes? Okay. Oh, man, there's just a few of us. Brittany and I and Aaron and Owen. There's, nobody else likes. We'll, we'll eat all the purple grapes. We don't know for sure which kind of grapes. Do you like purple grapes too, Easton? That's good. 
Okay. But the owner wants, he wants a share of these grapes. He's the one who created this. He owns it. And if you own it, you've got the right to decide what to be done with it. And tenants are not always helpful. So I live in a wonderful apartment downtown. And last summer, I came walking up my steps. And, you know, sometimes I walk up and I'll smell this wonderful smell in the hallway. Somebody's cooking. Oh, it's so good. And then I walk into my place and nobody's cooking. And... <laughs> And it smells, you know, really good. And I, I walked up the steps and I smelled something a little funny. And you know what? The next day it smelled a little funnier. And the next day it smelled pretty bad. So I texted my landlord and t turns out somebody had abandoned the apartment. But they hadn't quite cleaned it out. <laughs> oh, it, over, it was It was awful. That's, that's a problem tenant, isn't it? And that's how we can treat God. It's not ours. Our lives belong to him. And if you go back to Isaiah chapter 3, Isaiah is the prophet who keeps talking about the vineyards. Jesus is echoing him. And Isaiah 3, we read, The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. He says, it is you who have ruined my vineyard. And I haven't always taken good care of God's vineyard, and neither of you. So there's these problem tenants, but there's also somebody else, another person who shows up here. Who? The servant. And the, the owner sends a bunch of servants. And as people are listening to Jesus tell this, they know who the servants are because the servants, these sacred servants, they're the prophets of God. We read that Moses was the servant of the Lord. Samuel tells us about my servant David. Jeremiah says, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets. Amos talks about God revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. Zechariah says that God commanded his servants, the prophets. They say, we know about the servants. And the servants weren't always treated well. Jeremiah was you know, let down into a wet well and almost left there to die. They finally dragged him out with ropes just in time. So there's the owner, there's the tenants, there's the servants. That's the story. Isaiah's told them about this before. Other prophets have mentioned it. But this is where Jesus does something brand new. This is where Jesus surprises them. Jesus introduces a new person into the story. And the Jewish leaders don't like it. Who's the new person that Jesus introduces into the story? Jesus says the owner had one person left to send. A son whom he loved. If you think back to Jesus' baptism, we read about a dove coming over the, the water, coming over Jesus, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. Jesus is referring to himself here. He's not just making up a nice story. And the Jewish leaders probably understand he's talking about him. This is blasphemy in their minds. But he is the son of God. A son whom I love, whom he loved. They will res he sent him last of all saying they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him. And to me, it's remarkable because this is Monday or Tuesday, and all of this is going to come true on Friday. Jesus, who is the most popular man in Jerusalem this week, is going to be hanging on a cross on Friday. Everything is going to turn. 
And he's calling out to people, you belong, you are invited to the feast. God wants you to be part of his kingdom. And he points out what the problem was. He says, haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It says the only you've only made one big mistake. You've rejected the cornerstone. You've rejected the sun. You've rejected me. And Jesus is going to take our sin. He doesn't ask us to bear our own sin. He's going to take it for us. He's just told James and John, "Can you drink the cup I'm go- I drink?" And they said, "Yes, we can." But Jesus was talking about the cup of the judgment of the Lord. And in Mark 14, what does Jesus pray? So a couple chapters later, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Abba, Father. He's saying, Daddy, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. He is going to take this cup of judgment, and when he's hanging on the cross, we read, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. The debt is paid, that it is finished, it's actually what they wrote on invoices, when the debt was paid. So that's, that's why I put down that silly phrase, brother, can you spare a trillion? There's an old line, brother, can you spare a dime? But a dime is not going to pay off my sin. Psalm 49 tells us no one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom of a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. And if I got myself in debt trouble in downtown Spencer, I'm guessing the word would get around. Good news is that hasn't happened. I don't expect it to happen. And if it were $1,000, maybe it could bail me out. Let's say I got into into Hawk for $10,000. Somebody might be that kind. Somebody, you know, if I got down for $100,000 or a million, people could pool in and pool their resources and get me out of trouble. What if it was a trillion? We can't do that, can we? Our our federal government doesn't know how to deal with a trillion-dollar problem. And that's what my debt of sin was like. It's not $10,000. It's not a million dollars. It's beyond what anybody could deal with. And that's why the owner of the vineyard sent his son. And first, Peter, Peter tells us, You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you, but with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus made this perfect way. He came to change our lives. He came to bring us back home. That's the story of the vineyard. And then there's another five verses that we won't get to to do much with, but they come to Jesus and they say, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? I'm sorry, that's back in Matthew. That they they come in and they say, should we pay our taxes? Should we pay our taxes? And he says, hold up a coin. And the coin says Caesar But it doesn't only say Caesar, it says Caesar, son of God. Caesar is claiming to be the son of God, according to the coin that they're holding up. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. The coin is Caesar's because it's made in the image of Caesar. What are you, whose image are you made in? You're made in the image of God. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. You are made in the image of God. You belong rightfully to him. And so thinking about that, I was thinking about a 
Swedish pastor named Bo Geertz. He wrote a book I've had on my shelf for about two years now, wanting to read it. So ask me next week if I started reading it this week. I'm, I'm going to start reading it this week. It's called The Hammer of God. But Bo Geertz was born in Sweden, and his father was an eminent medical doctor. He treated the queen. His mother was from a great family. Her, her dad, Bo Geertz's grandfather, is the founder of Ericsson Phones. So, you know, great family. But his mother wasn't sure if there was a God. She was agnostic, and his father was an atheist. And so he was an atheist, and he didn't want anything to do with God. But they were in Sweden, so when he was a baby, they baptized him. They didn't believe anything. <laughs> but it seemed like a nice ceremony to go through, so they did. And then as Bo grew up, it was time for him to be confirmed. And there are some of you who are about at that age. And so his family wanted him to be confirmed. And Bo Geertz's father was required to go to church for his son to be confirmed. And something surprising happened along the way. So Bo's father had to be there. And this atheist medical doctor became a Christian in the middle of his son's confirmation training. And Bo was confirmed, and he was an atheist. That does not make any sense, does it? Confirmate, I want every young person to come through confirmation, and we're going to have a great ceremony in a couple of months, but we're not, I'm not demanding that you come through this ceremony. We're going to ask some really hard questions to our confirmation students, and they're good for every one of us to consider. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism? Will you worship regularly with God's people? Will you hear God's word and receive Holy Communion? Will you share Jesus' love and good news with others? Will you serve all people as a follower of Jesus? And then we'll ask the confirmation students to respond, I will, and I ask God to help me. And I don't want any of our confirmation students to lie. If, if that's not where your heart is, then then confirmation isn't the next step. Then you need to just keep seeking God and waiting to see how God is going to work in your life and get right with him. So Bear Gertz went on to Uppsala University. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm not Swedish, so I don't know these things. I'm just a poor Norwegian. He was studying at the university and he was disturbed by the immoral behavior of his classmates. He was an atheist, but he was disturbed by the, the rotten behavior of his classmates. And so he started attending a Christian student organization. And he became convinced of the historical truth of who Jesus was. And he became a Christian. He quit studying medicine and he took up theology instead. His dad was pretty mad because his dad wanted him to be the next doctor in the family. And a super famous theologian came to the university, Rudolf, Bolt, Rudolf Boltman. But he treated Christianity as a philosophy rather than as a religion. He tried to demythologize Christianity from angels and demons and miracles, heaven and hell. He said none of those things is real. And Bo Geertz had become convinced that these are the things that are real. And he made his lifelong motto, the message of the cross is the power of God. The message of the cross is the power of God. So that's what Jesus was trying to point people to, the power of God. And in a couple days, they were going to see all of that with their own eyes right in front of them. And that's why we go through this Lenten season. We are reminding ourselves of our need for Jesus' life within us, of our need for his forgiveness, of our need for reconciliation with the Father, of our need for the hope of heaven for all eternity. And we are going to experience Jesus fulfilling that as we walk through Holy Week and Easter. So 
You don't have to come up with a trillion. Jesus already did. That's the very good news. And so we're going to celebrate communion in a few minutes, and we're going to say, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. And if he's calling you to follow him, then this is the perfect morning to throw your heart open to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to come in and change me. I've made a mess. And he will come in and give you his, his own life for yours. Amen.